Hey, you 11s. Thanks so much for coming along. I know that I've started the webinar early. It just happens to be that it is the right time for me to be able to broadcast. I am going to be going through the June uh, 2019 paper. So this is last year's year 11 final exam. This is paper one, so it applies to both the triple science and the dual science students. So anybody, any one of you guys can come and watch this. Um, what I would also say is that I'm going to I'm going to be looking through the paper and I'm going to be going through each question, discussing why the answer is that one. I will also do the organic section, even though you guys haven't uh, finished your organics yet. I'm going to do it anyway. It just means that you can always watch this back after we've completed organics and look back at the questions that I'm going to do. I'm also going to try and um, talk through some alternative questions that are commonly asked on each of those topics when they're done. <clears throat> I'm also going to try and attempt to level each of the questions to kind of see where each one of you can address um, particular problems that you might have at particular levels. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen, see if we can get this working. Share. Cool. So, fab. I should now be sharing. I'm actually going to make my, I'm going to do that one. So there's my full screen. Fab. So, I'm going to be looking at leveling each of the questions. I'm going to try and get my laptop all set up. There we go. So level level questions. The first learning objective is understand the level eight and nine questions. Uh, do I want to switch to tablet mode? Uh, yeah. The A and A star. And I'm also going to recognize traps and common misconceptions. So I'm actually going to be doing the paper as if I'm sitting in an exam. Um, that way, it makes more sense, really, because it means a, it gives me the practice of seeing the questions as well, which is always useful, and it also means that you'll be able to kind of see the rough kind of timings for each question. So okay, so these papers have a kind of a standard uh, kind of structure to them. And the main thing really is this idea of increasing levels of difficulty as we move through. I'll point these out to you. Starts off easy, starts with the kind of content we were doing in um, GCSE in year nine and 10. So it starts off with dissolving. And one of the things that it's nice to point out is there are just certain people you guys have to know. And I'll make a key point of this and it's kind of nice. I will, I'm actually going to put together um, a practical uh, list of all, and I'm gonna do a webinar on them. Uh, of all the practicals you need to know for GCSE. And this is the first one, potassium permanganate, KMNO4. And this is a this is an oxidizing agent, and it's a very, 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 very dark purple. And it's very useful when doing dissolving and diffusion, because you often see these kind of nice gradients in color when you have them in solutions. And this question focuses on the practical from that. So it says, potassium permanganate is a solid, uh, is a purple solid dissolved in water. A crystal, a crystal of potassium permanganate is placed in a beaker containing water. And it says, after a short time, the crystal becomes smaller and the liquid at the bottom of the beaker becomes purple. State which of these explains the observation. So condensing, no. We know that condensing is turning um, um, a gas back into a liquid. That's not this case. The crystal is dissolving is going to be the correct answer. Uh, the crystal evaporates. Well, crystals can't evaporate because evaporation is going from a liquid to a solid. They could sublime. Iodine sublimes. Uh, just to give you an equation of what's occurring here, we've got KMNO4. Uh, KMNO4 solid becoming KMNO4 aqueous. Now, it's also nice to go the extra mile here. That there is the GCSE uh, early GCSE equation. But just to give you a little bit of further detail, um, this of course is ionic. We've got metals and non-metals here. So in reality, what's actually happening is the KMNO4, which is dark purple, is becoming, and that's a solid, is becoming K plus aqueous and MNO4 minus aqueous. That's the true reaction, that's the true dissolving process. The ions are separating. And it's actually this ion that makes it purple. Uh, group ones, of course, are all colorless. Uh, crystal melts? No. So a fairly nice lower level question to start off with. So 
this is just the observation and recognizing really the word dissolving and, re and recognizing it in a practical setting. So uh, this is kind of level one, two. So if I just put L one slash two on that one, very low level. Now, next, the beaker is left and change um, in the appearance of the liquid. Now, on this one, we can start predicting. So if we actually look at the practical, we know that there's going to be a second stage of this, which is what's going to eventually happen is instead of having this gradient of color, which you can see here, this dark purple, and then this colorless on top, what's eventually going to happen, of course, is it's just going to become uniform. It's going to become a uniform purple. And of course, this is the diffusion process. So all the liquid is, so it says, because it's left to the permanent and says, disappearance. So final appearance, all of the liquid is purple. It's going to probably be the correct answer. None of the liquid is purple. No. The, only the bottom of the liquid is purple. No. Only the top. No. So nice to see just diffusion coming in. And again, in a very practical setting, that again is a low level one or two. Um, but of course, it's an observation and it's uh, nice that we will, I'll actually, I'm going to start, I'm going to create a list of all the practicals that appear in this paper. That's actually worth doing. I'll collect that. Uh, I'll show you what I'll do. I'll, I'll, I'll mark that as we go through the paper and I can use that to build a sheet for you guys later on. So we've got the first practical here. I'll put crack here. And that's dissolving. Dissolving, dissolve, dissolving stroke diffusion. Because we recognize uh, the tube, of course, is one that you guys will recognize. Probably might appear later. Next, what process causes the change? Condensation? No. Crystallization? No. Crystallization, of course, is when solid crystals appear. It's when we're forming salts. Diffusion, of course, is our correct answer. And evaporation. Now, of course, this actually jumps. This actually is a slightly higher level. This is a 2 slash 3. Now, students often wonder why that is. And the reason, of course, is because they're using a very specific keyword here. So if you don't know your keywords, you can't access that question, which raises the level. So it's a good word to keep them in mind. And all of these words in that question are ones that you guys should all recognize. And it's something to bear that in mind, that is to recognize those questions. And if you're struggling, do keep a, do kind of collect those words. The formula for potassium permanganate is KMNO4. How many different elements are there in the permanganate? So okay, this is getting you guys to count atoms in compounds. So in this case, how many different elements? So this question comes in two varieties, and the answer to the question, of course, is three. The reason being is that we've got potassium as one type of element, manganese as our second type, and oxygen as our third type. The other question that is commonly asked for this is the total number of particles in the compound, total number of atoms in the compound. So if we were going to answer that one, of course, the answer, of course, is six. The reason being is we have one potassium, one manganese, and four oxygens. But of course, in this particular one, they're asking us to count the different elements in it. So the answer being a three. Uh, in terms of level-wise, that of course is the level three. It's low again, really three, four, because it's a common, that one is a, it's a very common mistake. And of course, they've given you the two options, haven't they? They've given you the three and they've given you the six. These are the only two options that students are going to pick up on. Oh, hi, Rhett. So nice to see you. Thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. It's good to see you. I hope all the revisions going well. So the two answers, of course, again, nice to see that the level is kind of steadily increasing here. And they've not used a particularly nice compound either. They're using one that there are students that, of course, won't recognize it. Another one, another one that's commonly used is potassium dichromate. Potassium dichromate is this one. And of course, if they asked you for the number of elements, the answer, of course, is still the same. Three elements, but the atoms, of course, the total number of atoms is different. So in this case, the total number of atoms being uh, 11, 11 atoms in total. Now, this one is a beautiful compound because it's bright orange. It's highlighter orange potassium permanganate. So that one's highlighter. And so it gives another good diffusion uh, observation. So another one that's used quite frequently. Let's continue. Right, into our periodic table. It's always nice. Give the letter. Okay, so common question. They've given us a periodic table. They've actually done a complete clone. It's quite nice, this. They've got hydrogen in that location, which is nice. They're trying to be consistent with the periodic table that you guys, of course, are given at the start of your exam. So I've actually taken that. I've got that up here. I've got that at the beginning of the paper, if I can now find it. There it is. And they've given you a complete clone of this paper um, and of this table. 
And so it, it, it obviously, this is always available to you. It's the second page in your exam. And it also has the key, something to always nice to have a reference to as well. Um, and a hydrogen, of course, being in the center. So in this case, they're asking you to, uh, they're checking to see whether or not you can read your periodic table at a relatively basic level. Give the letter from the diagram that represents a noble gas. And of course, that's T, and of course, T being helium. It's nice, that one, H-E. Next, the elements, uh, by the way, so level, of course, because the table's there, it's really going to be, uh, give the letter, that says T, and that's uh, a level, again, that's a very low level, two slash three. Elements L and M are in the same group. State why they have similar chemical properties. Right, much higher level. Big jump now at this point. We're now entering level three slash four. So I've had a big jump up here, recognizing similarities in chemical properties. So state why they have similar chemical properties. And this one, of course, actually, really, I, I think it's actually higher than that. It's really four slash five. And the reason being, and they're asking you to explain why they have similar chemical properties. L and M, L and M both have one electron, have one electron. I'll, I'll actually be good, I'll do this as if I'm in the exam. One electron in their outer, uh, in their outer, and notice I'm not using shell here, outer energy level, outer energy level. That means they're going to have similar chemical properties. Okay, so by the way, using again specific terminology, the levels increased by two there, up to four slash five, recognizing that you're gonna have to quote the number, students are gonna miss it, they're gonna have, they have the same number, they have to give the number one. So then of course, having to use the electron and the term outer energy level and not the name, not the words shell. An atom of element Q, has 31 protons, let's find Q, right. So Q has 31 protons. It's element number, oh, I'm gonna shrink my pen there. Element there has 31 protons, and they're asking us, use this information to explain how you can determine the number of protons in R. Right, let's have a quick look. Okay, that's quite a nice question, much higher level much higher we've now jumped again jumped up a level again this is now a level and notice two marks so two bullet points change my pen again so this is now a level five five really i'm going to give that a solid five so what they're wanting us to say is so as you move from left to right across a period um moving moving left to right left to right across, I don't know why I capitalized the outside. Moving left to right across table, across P table. I'd write periodic table in my exam if I was doing it. Uh, across periodic table, um, elements gain one proton. One proton gained each, gained each step. So what that means is we now need to, we need to use Q. They've given us the example of Q and R, so we need to we need to use that. So now we're saying we're going, we're moving from Q, from Q to R, moved right. Don't know why I'm capitalizing. It shouldn't do it. Ah, moved from Q to R, moved right twice. Two elements two boxes gaining therefore therefore gained two protons so i'm now going to have i'm now going to say that r has 33 protons i can see why they've given you by the way very ambiguous question not particularly nice in terms of the description it's they're asking you to understand how the periodic table is 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 written it's in order of atomic number, so the, as you move from left to right, you gain one proton every time, but the actual structure of the table is organized by our electrons, but it is in, in order of proton number. And that's a nice thing to note down. These are common misconceptions. So table, P table structure, P table structure is based on electrons, is electron based, electron based. However, it is organized, 
organized. In it's a in order. I'm going to put in order, in order of atomic number, of atomic number. An atomic number, of course, is proton number. Brackets, proton number. It's nice that very common question. Nice to see what they're doing. Okay, question number three is into your observations. I think. Year 11s, I'm pretty sure that you guys will not yet have started the process of learning your chemical tests. And guys, you can't make this stuff up. It's low level. It's low level. So everything is level 4 slash 5. 4, 5. However, that's really, that's level in terms of difficulty. Difficulty. If you want level in terms of if you want level in terms of what students are actually gaining on this, so this is actually achieved, achieved level. So in this case, it's actually going to be a level five, six. It's a level higher. The reason why it's a level higher is because students don't learn their colors. They don't learn their observations. I'll actually level each of these questions as we go through to show that there's actually a difference in each one. So. First one, a student does two tests on a solution made of a white solid. Okay, so white solid tells me it's not transition metal. It's quite nice. And it then says, give the formula of the ion that produced the red flame. Ah, oh, that's lithium at one plus. Right, common mistake is students will forget, of course, the plus one. And it, you must include that. Yeah, it's important that everyone forgets the plus. So level five, level five because students to get their charge. Green right. Harder. The reason being is, of course, they, they're a bit more ambiguous with the silver nitrate test, and the cream precipitate is going to be silver bromide. Now, just to explain why silver nitrate tests for three ions, the chloride ion, the bromide ion, and the iodide ion, and this, the chloride ion forms silver chloride, which is a white solid white precipitate and then bromide forms agbr silver bromide which is a cream precipitate and the agi is going to be a yellow precipitate so they're picking on this much it's harder than the flame test because it's how differences in kind of what they're expecting because the top one is asking you for the ion students forgetting the charge most commonly and this one's asking for the, the precipitate actual identity I think a lot of students will put the bromide ion rather than the actual identity of the precipitate. So identify the white solid. So we, now that we know that it was lithium was the metal cation in it, so we had Li plus, and the anion was Br minus. So the actual identity of the white solid is lithium bromide. I'm going to cut a, a cross through that because I don't want them to mark the ions. I want them to be marking this. Just to point out here, uh, again, by the way, still floating around the level five, six. There, the silver silver bromide is a much is actually a higher level. I'm going to put that at level six because students don't know it. They'll quote the bromide ion and not the solid. Happy to look at the equation if you like. The ionic equation for this with eight. Minus forming AGBR, that's the formation of the precipitate. Much higher level. Um, just to say, by the way, the word identity, to go back to that, I haven't forgotten. The word identity, it means that the common um, differences in this question is they will commonly ask you to name it. If they ask you to name it and you quote the formula, you're going to lose your mark. Watch out. They could also say, give the formula of it, in which case, they would then mark you down formula. Um, they would also then mark you down then, of course, if you put the name. In this case, they've asked you to identify, which means they accept both, which is quite nice. It lowers the level because it gives you options, um, but it's nice to see uh, and to discuss those differences. Next, the student uses a clean metal wire for the flame test. State why the wire should be clean when used in the flame test. So the wire, of course, is reused constantly. So it needs to be clean to prevent, to prevent previous, previous solids, 
stroke ions, uh, previous solids um, on wire, giving us an incorrect flame test to prevent previous solids being on the wire. Yeah. Uh, comma, um, giving fake flame tests. I don't think it's actually required. That'd be nice to look at a mark scheme on that one. So what they want, but it would be so we're moving the old ions to prevent other flame tests coming through as well. Do you know what? That's the first one that I now want at this point to look now at the actual mark scheme from Edexcel themselves, and we can mark all of the rest of them now as well. That's the actual paper. I want the mark scheme. Uh, here's the mark scheme. Let's go all the way up. The first one I really want to actually see. This is frustrating. My laptop is struggling a little bit. I'm wondering whether I need to plug it in. It might be quite useful if I did. Let's keep going. Come on. There we go. Right. So dissolving. All the liquid is purple. Diffusion. Uh, three is the correct number of elements. T is our noble gas. They have the same number of electrons in their outer shell, except they have the same number of valence electrons. They have one valence electron. Except outer energy level. They actually want you to use the word shell. And it's being accepted as outer energy level. Isn't that fascinating, Edexcel and their inconsistencies there? I wouldn't use outer shell. I still wouldn't, even though it's technically wanted on the thing. Um, next, explanation. 33 is one mark for M1 because the atomic number of R is two more because R is two places to the right. I like it. We're okay with all those. Lithium ion, silver bromide. In here's the question that we wanted. Impurities slash other substances could alter or interfere with the flame of the result test. So it says impurities, other ions, other substances contaminate flame, um, contaminate the wire. Okay, impurities, other ions. I think we're okay with that. We would definitely have got that mark. But it's nice to say prevent previous solids being on the wire. Um, impurities, it's nice to add that, and do you know what, I'm going to add that in red, because it's nice for me to say, I would have got the mark, but I definitely like to have that improved answer. Impurities, impurities, um, could alter flame color, could alter flame color, I like it. I, I definitely think I'd want to say that alternative, how it's going to affect the flame color. Yeah, I think so. I'm, I may have even been, I'm going to be super mean to myself there and not give myself that. I think that's reasonable. The table, um, the table lists properties of some metals. Two properties needed in a metal wire for use in a flame test. Well, we don't care about conductivity. We're sticking it in a flame. High density, don't care about how heavy it is. We do need it to have a high melting point and we do need it to be unreactive. Now, guys, a common other question that revolves around this one is you're actually expected, and this is where a practical appears, prac, and this, of course, is flame tests. I should do all my prac things, flame tests. Um, and that is just to mention the wire is actually called nichrome wire. And you actually need to know that. You're expected to know it. The alternative to nichrome is platinum, but we don't tend to use it because it's too expensive. But the reason why we use nichrome wire is because it has a high melting point and it's unreactive. Therefore, it won't react with the substance we're putting on it and it won't itself give up any color. So definitely a point to know. Oh, another practical base question, chromatography. So this is PRAC. By the way, this comes up year after year after year. So this one is one to know, chromatography. Okay, explain two mistakes the student has made. Okay, so we recognize this. We've got our water here, which is our solvent. Yes, yeah, so this is our solvent in this case. We've put our line, and they've drawn the line in ink. We don't do that. There's the first mistake. We always draw the line in pencil because ink, of course, could potentially be soluble and therefore run up the page. So we use graphite from a pencil because it's insoluble. The second thing is, of course, the water line is above the pencil line. So the ink is going to, it's going to run straight down. It's going to dissolve straight into the water instead of running up the page because we want the ink to run up. But if we put the if we put it straight into the water, the ink just hops off into the water, and we don't get it to run up the page. So, two 
two mistakes, very clear, very obvious ones. So ink, baseline and ink. Do we need, now this is four marks. Baseline and ink. So we need to first of all state the error, there's one mark, and then we also need to explain what problem this is. That's recognizing the mark scheme. It doesn't really, it says here, explain two mistakes. It's the explain word that students are gonna make, miss. Students are gonna write in the basic answer and then not explain it. So the baseline and ink is one mark. We're gonna follow that up with um, ink line could, could, um, run up page, run up page, up page, could be soluble, yeah, what that means is it's also going to potentially be mixing with your colours as well, could also, could also mix with inks, inks on paper, giving us false colours, we're going to get more spots than we expect, We'll check the mark scheme for that one. It's a good one to check. The next one, of course, is the water level's too high. So second mark, so sorry, second point, water level, water level too high. So water level too high. What that means is ink won't run up page. Ink won't run up page. Instead, will dissolve. Instead, ah, instead, will dissolve into water. Let's check the mark scheme. Definitely good to know these, because these kind of questions, these wordy ones, require us to be very clear. Baseline has been drawn, and therefore, it will interfere or contaminate the results. So it will also accept not drawn in pencil, will produce other colors, will move up the paper, will get mixed with the other inks, and we've covered all the bases there. We've actually hit both, which is nice. The water level is above the ink, and therefore the inks will mix with the water. There we go. The inks will dissolve, and the inks will wash off the paper. There you go. So we've actually got an added one there that's not on the mark scheme, but we've definitely got that. Therefore, the inks will mix with the water. They will dissolve into the water immediately. Let's go back to my paper. I like that. Okay, next, of course, now we're doing interpretation of chromatography. Um, how many colors does ink D contain? And the answer, of course, is three. State which of the inks tested um, could be mixed together to make ink D. So to make ink D, we need all three of those spots. So we're gonna need, of course, B, and we're gonna need A. If we mix A and B together, we will get all of those spots. So it's the mixture of A and B, which is going to give us D. Next, explain, oh, two marks, explain which of the inks tested is insoluble. And of course, that one is now going to be C very clearly. So C for one mark, and we're going to say explain which of the tests is insoluble. So what is telling us that C is insoluble? And the answer is, of course, it hasn't run up the page. So C, due to ink not moving, not moving up paper. Notice how I've switched from page to paper. I prefer paper, I think it's better. Due to ink not moving up paper, meaning not soluble. I like that. Cool. So a common follow-up question that would be here and notice that the, oh, isn't that fascinating? There's a gap here. There was an additional question which they have removed. That would have been part four. And that question will have been, oh, I haven't done that. Uh, it's obviously IV. Um, the question that will have followed that will suggest how you could make C run up the page. And that would be to use an alternative solvent. So if we wanted to actually get the, the content of C, we're going to have to switch from water to another solvent. Um, alternative solvent. Alternative solvent that would dissolve C. That would dissolve C. Uh, and if they asked you to suggest to, that would dissolve C. And the suggestions are always ethanol, good old alcohol, 
You can also use acetone if you like girls. Acetone is nail polish remover. Otherwise known as, by the way, commonly known, uh, sorry, that's the common name. The actual name is propanone. You could use either. But ethanol is the most common solvent that they tend to refer back to at this point. So ethanol is a good choice. Okay, change of question. In 1937, an airship full of hydrogen flew from Germany to America. Which property of hydrogen makes it suitable for airships? Hydrogen is the lightest gas that we have. It is a low density. The reason being, of course, is that hydrogen on the periodic table has a mass of one. This is its mass number. Number of protons and neutrons. Number of one. However, it travels around in pairs. So its MR, its relative molecular mass, is of course two, because it's two of them. And helium, which we now use, has got an atomic mass of four. So that has an AR of four. So hydrogen's actually twice as light as helium. So it's actually more ideal. You can use less gas, half the gas, to get the same amount of lift. Explain why helium, of course, is now used instead. And this is because helium, helium is inert, is a noble gas. Let's give as many bullet points as we can. Helium is a noble gas, therefore unreactive therefore unreactive and however we now now that we've stated what hyd helium is we now need to say hydrogen is explosive is explosive therefore dangerous therefore dangerous i like it i'd like to see the mark scheme for that so uh, explanation c because the spots did not move i like it Let's keep going. C, it has a low density. Helium is inert, does not react with oxygen. Hydrogen is flammable slash explosive in air. I like it. Cool, we're doing well. Hydrogen is used in the manufacture of ammonia. By the way, in terms of levels wise, I've kind of quit on the levels. The chromatography is a low level in general. Um, testing for ions, of course. Uh, the impurities one, that's of course is a level 5, but a tricky level 5. Then we've got our inert wire, uh, that's again a low level, level 4 slash 5, very low again. Uh, of course they can raise it by asking you for the actual nichrome itself. Chromatography, spotting errors, level 4 slash 5, level 4 again, still lower level. Um, a clever mixture question, I like that, and in terms of mix them to get uh, D, it's rather neat. Alternative solvents, of course, jumps up a level, but they haven't given it to you. They're keeping it low at the beginning of the paper. Low density, noble gases, now still floating around the level four, five marks. We haven't seen anything really, really tough yet. Hydrogen is used in the manufacture of ammonia. Hydrogen is reacted with nitrogen using an iron catalyst. Give the chemical equation for this reaction. First really tough one. So level, level five, six, hard. So we're now having to realize they have given us nothing. They're realizing that you have to build this from its elements. So we're going to react nitrogen, N2. By the way, nice to meet you all, I mentioned, ah. Uh, Mr. Duncan, would that Q pop up in an exam, or have they completely removed it? Alternative solvent that would dissolve three. Hydrogen is it, uh, Elijah, hydrogen is it. Oh, Elijah, great to see you. Thank you so much for coming along. Ah, uh, um, Ira, good question. The answer is yes, they will still ask it. They just haven't on this. No, they haven't removed it entirely. They've just not asked it on this paper. So, no, absolutely it crops up. Quite frequently, actually. I'm surprised it wasn't there. They do like the alternative solvent one. It, do you know what? It wouldn't actually surprise me if it appeared later on in the paper. When we get to organics, it can every now and again reappear down there. Because ethanol, of course, is being an organic solvent. So it does appear. Good question. Well done. I like. I like. Um, I'm really glad you asked. Right. Another thing here I want to point out. Year eleven. Is it said? Give the chemical equation. Right. I need you all to realize that word equations. The only time you will ever use those is if they actually say the word word equation. Yeah. Otherwise, you're in symbol. So this is N two. Plus hydrogen, of course, both end in gen, which means it travels around. All elements that end in gen or en are diatomic. And, of course, we're going to end up. Now, just to say, I've got students here who are going to go, I recognize this is an equilibrium. And it is. This is the production of ammonia. We've 
Students will now forget to balance. Please don't. Two nitrogens, two nitrogens, two hydrogens, six hydrogens, so three here. Most common mistake, students forget to balance. By the way, you do. they will not penalize you for using this as a single direction arrow. They won't mind. So it's quite nice that, but of course, it's nice to have the better chemistry. We know that this is an equilibrium. Let's check that on a mark scheme. It'll say, allow reversible. There you go. Reversible arrow accepted, which is quite nice. Let's go back to the paper. State why a catalyst is used in this reaction. Right. That's quite a nice question. Because I actually, when I teach um, kinetics, I taught you guys that there were two catalyst questions. And notice there's a space. They've removed one, which is quite nice. So we'll fill one in as well. But this is saying, why do you ever want to use a catalyst? And the reason why is because it increases the rate of reaction. Why use a catalyst? A catalyst, a catalyst increases the rate of reaction. Increases the rate of reaction. You can make more in a given time. You don't need to actually do that here, but if it said in industry, why do they do that? And two marks, increase the rate of reaction, therefore produce more in the same amount of time, make more profit, sell more. Um, but that is the same question, of course, as um, what is a catalyst? But it doesn't require the second mark. So this that's really nice, this. We know catalyst questions. There are, in reality, there's actually about four different ones. The two that I always commonly say is, what is a catalyst? What is a cat? A substance that increases the rate of reaction, but itself not used up. Followed by explain. Explain how a cat works. How a catalyst works. It provides an alternative route with a lower activation energy. Therefore, more particles have activation energy. Therefore, more successful collisions, increased weight. Um, but it's nice to see why, why a cat, why a catalyst, it increases the rate, therefore you can make more and in less time. You could also have, give examples, examples of catalysts. You need to know the iron metal examples. Uh, I'll cover that one later. Platinum for the catalytic converter, um, iron for the Haber process. Vanadium pentoxide, ugh, for the, for the contact process, platinum metal, iron metal, these are all the ones you need. Next. Okay, continuing with the metal theme. The reactions of metals with water. Uh, by the way, in terms of level-wise, it's nice to do the levels. Uh, explain why a catalyst, we drop down again, back to a level, in fact, why a cat is going to be a level 3, 4, I'll put it as a 4, 3, 4. But it's nice the equation is giving you the first five or six. Next. Right. Reactivity. So they've given us a table, metals, W, X, Y, and Z. And it's asked us to put them in order of reactivity. Okay. So. Okay. So we've got W. We've got the reaction with water. Okay. Let's see again. Reaction with water and the reaction with acid. Okay. Those are my key words here. So, W, no reaction, no reaction. Okay, so very low reactivity. So, in terms of my reactivity series, eek, I'm not going to do this very well, guys. Potassium, sodium, ooh, calcium, magnesium, uh, aluminium. Uh, what about that? Yeah, I'm actually, rather than me trying to list them all, let's go and track it down. So we've got uh, reactivity series. Uh, if students are wondering how I don't, there you go. I've put it all in order so far, but it's nice then. Students often say, do I have to learn it? Um, so the answer is, it's useful to know. Notice that I've got the top, and then I was just getting messy. But really, it's recognizing al aluminium is an important one. Iron and carbon are important ones. And hydrogen and copper are the important ones. They come up a lot. Bear those in mind. Um, but this one, if it hasn't reacted with water, that's not uncommon for metals not to react with water. But if they're not react with acid, it means you've got to be below hydrogen. So we've now got zinc, oh, iron, and then tin. Oh, I'm going to get this wrong. 
spin, lead, UV, and then there's hydrogen. And hydrogen, of course, H plus is what makes an acid an acid. That's an acid. So if you don't react with acid, you're below this. So that, that one's going to be very low. And then we've got a very slow reaction. So it is reacting, it is reacting, but it's very slow. No reaction reacts slowly. That one is reacting. It reacts quickly, reacts violently. Right. So this one's the least for the start, and this one's the most. That makes it easy for a start. Um, and we can actually see what the other ones are as well. So hang on. So the least, most reactive is going to be Z. So most, it's got to either be him or him. So it's either C or D immediately. Next one, the least reactive is W. <laughs> so they're the same. So they could still both be correct. We just need to now get X and Y in position. So, right. X is more reactive than Y. The reason being is it has actually reacted with both. Just it's been really slow. So X is more reactive than Y. So the answer is going to be B. That's quite clever. Good, by the way, you're having to work quite hard on that. That one there is level five, six. Having to work quite hard. Next, state which metal could be copper. Oh, okay. There's your first level seven splash eight. Okay, first read the top, and it's only a one marker. So, okay, that's a hard one. The reason being is if you don't know your, your reactivity series, you'll be guessing. And the answer is it can only be one of them. And it's the one that didn't react with the acid. So it's W. So W could be copper. Which metal could be magnesium even harder? There's your first level eight. Because at this point, by the way, you can rule this out. You can do this by a little bit of deduction. Because there's only two people it could be. Uh, it could either be, it could either be Z or it could be X. The only two people it could be. Well, in reality, of course, it ain't Z. It reacts quickly with water. It's only one group of metals that do that, although actually technically calcium does. Um, but that's going to be a group one. Violently with acid? Group one is still two, three, four, actually. Uh, Z doesn't have to be a group one. It could be calcium. Calcium reacts very violently. It is, reacts quickly with water and violently with acid. It could be. Uh, the answer, of course, for magnesium is X. Now, that's a fascinating one. That's something that we need to do. That's a practical. That is knowing magnesium. That's a magnesium practice. And there's a couple of magnesium practicals that you guys need to know. You need to know magnesium with, with acid. You need to know magnesium with steam. I know, I know it's a bizarre one. Magnesium and steam and magnesium with water, apparently. That's tricky. Very tough. So that one's going to be, X is going to be slow. I'm going to have to check that now, folks. I'm going to be correct, but I do want to check it anyway. <laughs> right, increase the rate of reaction. There we go for our catalyst. Next, uh, B was correct. W and X, there we go. So X, X was magnesium. Let's just go back and check that I did that. I did. Okay. A displacement reaction can also be used to decide the order of reactivity of two metals. State two observations, one magnesium, okay, there's another practical of magnesium. So we need also magnesium displacements. Okay, nice to know. And in particular, this has got one in mind. And that's copper sulfate. You guys need to know him. It's blue. And you guys know this. You guys know this. Blue. Copper sulfate, it's actually, by the way, hydrated copper sulfate's blue, just so you know, but this is in water. If copper sulfate's in water, it's blue. It's actually the test for water uh, and hydrous, but we'll come back to that one in a minute. So we're going to add, we've got a beaker. Let's actually draw this practical out. We've got a beaker, and we're going to add a blue solution. A blue solution of copper sulfate. There we go. Be blue. And the reason why it's blue is because it has a transition metal in it. We're going to add a more reactive magnesium metal. And magnesium metal, of course, is silver. So this goes in as a silver ribbon. <laughs> it looks like a fish. Uh, and, of course, what's going to happen is as soon as that's added, we're going to see a change in color. Uh, now I'm going to be quite picky on my colors here, and you guys all know this. It's going to become pink. 
what it's going to become more colors let's go for that pink it's not that kind of pink it's kind of um it is it's like that kind of thing it's going to turn pink and the solution is going to become colorless it's going to lose the blue and the reason why is this reaction the magnesium which went in as a silver solid silver solid now reacts with the blue copper sulfate solution which is aqueous and that's blue solution and what's going to happen is i'm going to form magnesium sulfate aqueous which is a colorless solution colorless sol and i'm going to form solid pink copper metal and that's pink let's check the mark scheme what do we what do they want okay brown they accept brown Ooh, brown pink pinky brown <laughs> solid forms in the solution turns colors uh, i like it so there are all of our good things it's nice to see clear being ignored it's nice but and by the way can anyone guess what should have followed this one that's still really higher level this is seven and eight this is level seven eight this for sure because you've got to know your observations can't make that stuff up this is seven eight this could have been a nine and the nine would have been the equation so bear that in mind dear 11s yeah that's gonna be they they can very easily give that to you they'd probably ignore the state symbols but absolutely they can make that a nine just with a very simple addition it doesn't appear like they have any space though so i don't think that was ever intended to be a level nine but it's quite nice ah oh, we're into bonding explain why silicon dioxide ah silicon dioxide has a high melting point right we're gonna run susan boyle sings nelly the elephant right the structure of silicon dioxide so sio2 is a giant covalent structure i like it next what are the bonds strong oh, no, no no covalent bonds only covalent bonds only in sio2 just like diamond strength covalent bonds are very strong oh, very strong next the number there are millions of bonds there are millions of bonds and by the way yes i'm going all the way folks there's two marks but i don't know which two they want i'm just going to give them all there are millions of bonds lots of energy needed to break them all energy needed to break i like it just run it all you have no choice and i would definitely not recommend people to try picking them don't do it let's check the mark scheme shall we it's always nice to do so what did they want it says so they wanted silicon dioxide has many strong covalent bonds they're blending them together nightmare large amounts of energy is required to break or overcome the bonds overcome the forces i like it so guys if i hadn't run all the way to the end of that process i would have lost them because they actually just want there are many strong covalent bonds they blended it together they want the word many guys they're putting them together you can't do it just give the lock don't do it just run run it explain why graphite conducts electricity right graphite is of course a very special substance it gets all its own stories we've got to know all of her stories the graphite has right this is actually a four mark question but they're going to run her story all the way through so number one each each carbon atom each carbon atom makes three <laughs> i was ahead of myself makes three i'm gonna zoom in a bit three covalent bonds covalent bonds fourth unpaired electron unpaired electron becomes delocalized becomes delocalized and and can flow 
between the layers between the layers carrying the charge through the structure it can flow between the layers through the structure through the structure i know i've gone off the end through the structure carrying charge what do they want they wanted delocalized electrons can flow from a bed graphite has delocalized electrons that are able to flow through the structure i like it but guys i wouldn't trust them you've got to give the whole thing don't trust them state white diamond is hard but graphite is soft uh Ah, uh, diamond. Got to do this in two stages. By the way, you realize the level jump. So these are now all level seven slash eights. This one is even it's harder, really. This is actually eight slash nine. Even though they've simplified it, that question, if that real question, it should have been four marks. Yeah. Why is graphite soft? And that's, of course, a seven slash eight. Right. The reason why, just so you know, the reason why the graphite one is a higher level, 8, 9, is because you have to recognize, you have to talk about this unpaired electron and delocalization. These key words are higher level, difficult to get, and students miss them. Statewide diamond is harbor graphite is diamond, is only, is only covalent bonds. Only covalent bonds in a giant structure. Giant structure. Graphite. Graphite has weak intermolecular intermolecular forces between the layers. Between the layers. The layers, layers, therefore, can slide. Or, by the way, it's so nice to see all the graphite stories appearing there. They've done a clever thing with a comparison to diamond. Really nice. High level, though. It's nice to see all my bonding hitting those big, big grades. Next. Right. Balance the equation. So, okay. It's actually a tough balance. A complicated one actually for once so you're always going to do oxygen last because it's an element do it last so we've got two carbons let's let's do this atom by atom two carbons right where's my line draw my line two carbons in two carbons out we're good next oh five hydrogens six hydrogens how can i fix that let's put a two there i've changed somebody start again Start again. I've changed somebody. Obviously, me color coding it is making it a bit ridiculous to be fair, but it's fine to use it. Right, so two carbons, two carbons, six hydrogens, six hydrogens. Right, next, chlorines, two chlorines. Oh, two chlorines, that's nice. Oxygens, two here, one here. Oh, I'm gonna put a half. I can do that with the elements. Right, now the problem is I don't like halves of GCSE. So what I'm now going to do is double everybody. Two. Four. Four. One. Two. And two. Let's check it. Four carbons. Four carbons. Oh. So I've got eight eight hydrogens here yeah and i've also got another four so i've got 12 in total 12 hydrogens i've just completed that 12 hydrogens in total there how many do i have over here i've got eight and i've got four i've got 12 that is well four coins oxygens two oxygens two hard equation tough that there is a level seven many students will make a mistake Next, in the second stage, one, two, dichloride, right, we're now into organics, folks. You have not studied organics yet. So what that means is any of the stuff that I'm doing here, I'll flag up the bits that you do know and the bits that you don't. But don't worry about this. You can look back at this at a later date. What is meant so you can answer this one? This one, you can do. Thermal decomposition. The breakdown, the breaking, breaking of 
a compound breaking of a compound using energy. Thermal decomposition. Let's check that mark in the normal Right, let's have a look. Diamond. Every atom is bonded to four. Diamond is a 3D lattice structure. Every carbon is bonded to four other carbons. Oh, okay. So allow 3D rigid structure. Reject mention of inter well, that's yeah, that's because that's incorrect. That's interesting. Rigid tetrahedral lattice. Every carbon at all. I think my all covalent bonds is allowed. I'd definitely give it to myself, but it's nice to add that detail into my answer. Graphite is soft because the layers can slide. Okay, so we get definitely get the slide mark. We always get that. But next, all right? There's my balance. Oh, I like it. Accept multiples and fractions. Woo! Breaking down by heating. It works to this effect. Well, keep going. State by chloroethane is described as unsaturated. Right. Unsaturated means that it contains a carbon carbon double bond. It contains that's literally this is a definition. Define unsaturated. A compound containing carbon carbon. Yes, you have to say those words. Carbon carbon double bond. And people often say, why do I need to say carbon carbon? Because you can get carbon oxygen double bonds you can get actually many other double bonds so you have to say carbon carbon unsaturated. give the test for unsaturation that like chloe is unsaturated this is the test is the bromine water bromine water is the test and it will ch change from orange 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 to colorless in the presence of a carbon carbon double bond name the polymer formed chloroethene poly chloroethene <laughs> isn't that lovely yeah nice and easy by the way it's nice to see another chemical test coming in higher level in the structure and bonding bits and we've dropped a level the equation was high but a nice definition running there a level five I'll put level four five less really breaking using heat it's more like a three four then we've got definition. Can... Contains carbon that raises the level of five, six. Name the polymer. Very easy one. Students still commonly make mistakes, of course, but it's a low level. Four. Three, four. Right. Fire extinguisher. Sorry, my laptop's slowing down a little bit. It's doing tests. Show by right, so now we're into calculation. It's nice that we've got some calculation so I've got a calculator, which is unfortunate. Show by calculation the empirical formula. Right. So carbon. I'm gonna actually shrink my pin now to make this a little bit smaller. So I need to show my process here. So carbon at eight point zero five percent. I'm gonna switch that now to grams. Divide that by twelve. Next, bromine. Change the percentage to grams. Divide that by ooh, uh, 80, the bromine. And then fluorine, which is 38.26. Change that to grams. Divide that by 19. <laughs> I think that's right. Uh, I'm going to check that on my periodic table. Bromine at fluorine 19. Let's just quickly have it all the way back to the top. Scroll to the top. This is where my. My laptop is oh, there. We go. So bromine is indeed eighty. Top number. Great job. Fluorine is ninety. Now the great thing, of course, is I didn't really need to check that because in reality, if I got it wrong, I would have got a different formula. So this question drops a level because it's asking you to proof a formula rather than. By the way, I've no idea where my uh, where my paper's gone. It's my laptop, so I'm going to get an issue. I just need to leave it for a second to it, uh, clear itself. Up, I think. Come on. Where are you? I've lost it. My, uh, my tablet is having a hissy fit. Oh, sorry about this, folks. I just decided to not to enjoy it. So. Let's 
Okay. Come on, computer. It really is having a bit of. Yeah, let's see if I can clear some memory. Because, of course, I think the more I write, the more this builds up in terms of data wise, and it's just. Oh, one note is really having a uh, coming back. It's just taking its time, isn't it? Come on, there we go. I don't know whether or not I need to go a bit more slowly with, through this because it's really struggling at the minute. I don't know whether I can increase the pace. There we go. It's slowly doing it. It's just my laptop is struggling. <laughs> Still, still, still very slow. I do apologize for this, folks. That'll teach me to go back to the period of table at the beginning of that. Oh, there we go. It's just taking it. It's just, I didn't need to, I knew the numbers. But still, it's just a stroke. It's just. Sorry, folks, you can just relax for a minute. And we get, there we are. We're finally there. Let's zoom back. There we go. Right, so let's run our numbers. So the marks, of course, are for all the process. So 8.05 divided by 12 equals gives me 0.671. Next, bromine. So we've got 53.69 divided by 80 gives me 0.671. Next, 38. 0.26 divided by 90 gives me 2.01. That'll do. Right. Divide them now all by the smallest. 0 0.671, 0 0.671, 0 0.671. So they come out as 1. That comes out as 1. And then 2 divided by 0 0.671. And I get an answer of exactly 3. 3.00. So, final empirical formula is CBRF3. I like it. Next, the diagram below, Halon 1301. I like it. Draw a dot and cross diagram. Right. So this is, so this is again from structure and bonding. In terms of level wise, guys, that level there for that calculation was a level five. If they'd run, wanted you to run an empirical formula without a, this is a proof of an empirical it would have been much higher it would have been a level seven seven eight so dot and cross diagram you've got five circles five oh why am i doing it's taking me still still uh, struggling a little bit on me so there we go i have got five atoms five circles and yes they are a pain to draw right there we go f f f put all my atoms in right now join my dot and crosses in the gaps each one's a single bond. Right, and now I've got to remember to put all the dots on everybody else. And that's what everyone, of course, will forget. They'll put the ones in the gap. It's only one mark. Oh, no, two marks. So if you put the right number in the gap, you'll still get some. There we go. We're done. So you've just got to make sure that all the outer ones are on. That's what everyone will forget there. Oh, a good Susan Boyles again. So we've got explain a low boiling point. Oh, my laptop has just started to do something irritating. Okay, explain why it has a low boiling point. Susan Boyle sings Nelly the Elephant. So we've got structure, simple covalent. My uh, laptop is shaking, folks, if you're wondering what's going on. Uh, the structure is simple covalent. Structure is simple covalent. Simple covalent structure. We have got weak intermolecular forces. Inter 
molecular, we've got our WIMPs, weak intermolecular forces between molecules, between molecules. These are very weak. The WIMPs are very weak. These are very weak. Number, there are very few. There are very few of these. A very few WIMPs. And of course, therefore, energy is low. Energy, not a lot of energy needed to break. Let's do it that way. It's a better answer. Notice, by the way, that we've gone into a week. This is, of course, a much higher level. So, uh, oh, sorry. Hang on. Not much energy needed to break. Needed to break. Next. Okay. We're nearly at the end now, I think, folks. So I think we must be coming to the end shortly. I, I hope, anyway. Okay. State the term isomer. You haven't uncovered it yet. Same molecular formula. Same molecular formula. And that's C5H2, 12. But different, different structural formula. Structural form. Draw a display of another isomer. Four carbons in a row. Add a branch. Break a carbon off and put it on as a branch. It's a diff. It's the same molecular formula. It's still five carbons. It's still twelve hydrogens. But now it has a different structural formula. Different arrangement in space, if you like. Uh, reactions of alkanes in the halides. UV light. A bromine steals a hydrogen. C5H11Br, and we're going to end up with C... No, then we, of course, have the other product. Other product is HBr. Name this type of reaction. Ooh. This type of reaction is actually called a... Oh, it's a substitution. It's actually a free radical substitution, but you just know it as a substitution reaction. Substi reaction <coughs> next combustion so on to burning of things what are we doing for time wise doing okay oh lovely calculation i like it standard calculation as well calculate the mass of oxygen required to burn 32 grams of methane right so i have methane and i want the mass of oxygen required Right, so number of moles, moles of methane, grams over rams, grams over rams. So we've got 32 grams of methane over its MR, which they've even given to you, low as the, low as the level, which gives us two moles. Right, what is the ratio? <coughs> the ratio of these two is two in that gen. So we need to double it. Therefore, oxygen, O2, is four moles but they don't want moles moles they want grams so we need to reorganize grams over rams so we now do number of moles is grams over rams let's reorganize we want grams let's bring that over so moles times rams gives me grams so i now have four four times the mr of oxygen which is 32 they didn't give you that of course so that's going to be uh, 64 one hundred and twenty-eight grams. Next. Okay, so this is a combustion test. You'll see this soon, folks. Explain why water is collected in the U-bend. It is being condensed by the cold water. The ice bath, ice bath cools steam and condenses it condenses it back into water, into liquid water. Next, describe how anhydrous copper sulfate can be used to test for water. Anhydrous copper sulfate, white, white when no water present, turns blue turns blue 
when in contact with water. Knowing bar, there's been a lot of chemical tests on this paper. Explain the change in the appearance of the lime water. Oh, that's lovely. Three marks. Oh, level, level nine, folks. No one ever gets this. It's quite a rare thing to see. Are we at the end of the paper? No, not quite. So, chemical equation for lime water. Sorry, my laptop's taking a break again. I can do it without it. So the lime water is calcium hydroxide. Calcium hydroxide is aqueous. It reacts with carbon dioxide. So there's the mark. So CO2 reacts, reacts with lime water to form calcium carbonate water. Uh, reacts with lime water forming calcium carbonate and calcium carbonate forming calcium carbonate which is insoluble so it forms a white solid next hence cloudy sorry my laptop is again taking a break by the way the screen's shaking away definitely need to fix my laptop there we go. On to calorimetry. How are we doing for time as well? Right. Use the results of the experiment. Okay. So the student, ammonium nitrate dissolved in water. I like it. Measure the temperature before and after. Use the results in the experiment to explain the type of reaction taking place. Okay. So first thing, need to say temperature has dropped. And this is two marks. Temperature has dropped. Temperature has dropped. Energy, energy is being absorbed from surroundings. Absorbed from surroundings. It is endothermic. Endothermic. Nice and easy. Recognizing, there we go, it says endothermic. Show that the energy change Q is about 2,400 joules. Right, so we need, the, we need all of our data for this. This is Q equals MC delta T. Q equals MC delta T. They haven't actually given you the equation in this, this time, which is quite unusual. So what was our mass of water? Right, we need to go and check. So we've got eight grams. Ah, oh, we've got 100 centimeters cubed of water. There's my water. And my temperature change is a 5.8 degree drop, I think. Uh, my laptop is hiccuped once again. There we go. So we had 100 grams of water times by 4.18, the number they've given us here. And right, now we're going to have, my, there's going to be a mark for this, isn't there? We started at 20 and ended up at 14.8? Uh, 14.8, I think. Or 14.2. Every time I, I move my screen now, my laptop is very, very, very much struggling with this. It's, it's really struggling. It's overheated. I've lost it. Uh, poor computer. 14.8. I, I, if I scroll up, it's just it's just going to freak out again. There we go. 14.2. 20 minus 14.2. Come on. Sorry, folks. It just doesn't work quite as fast as I do. And as I said, it's very much struggling a little bit. I don't even know whether or not if I clear any anything that's running, whether or not it's going to help. I don't think it is. So minus 14.2, and I get a number of something like, I don't know, 2,400 and something. Next, use your answer. So that's going to be 2,000. Let's just have a look on the mark scheme for that one. I think that's probably worthwhile, don't we? 
There's little energy required. Got our equations, solutions. There we go, 128 was good. Cooled, turns blue. Calcium carbonate forms, that's all good. It's nice to see that. Endothermic. Decrease in temperature. There you go. So 2,420 is our final mark for that. 2,420. And then it says, use your answer to calculate the, the enthalpy change. Right, again, not giving you the equation. Delta H equals Q over N. We've got to remember that's in joules and we need it to be in kilojoules. So we've got to divide by 1,000 first. So 2.42 kilojoules. We've divided 2,420 divided by 1,000. We've just done that. Divided by the number of moles. Right. Moles is, of course, they've given us the MR of ammonium nitrate and we had 8 grams of it. So number of moles is grams over rams. 8 over 80. Ah, which is 0 0.1. So uh, it's the same as times it by 10, is it not? Ooh. So we've got 24.2 kilojoules per mole. Next. Okay, so plot a graph. I'm not going to bother plotting the graph. Um, draw on the grid what you expect from, from label this curve. Okay. Well, I kind of want to do plot. Do want to plot the graph now. How are we doing for... Still got quite a long way to go on this paper. I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to finish it here today, folks, because the if we've been going for an hour and 16 minutes, I'm going to pause at this question. I think it's a good place to pause this at question 13. And I'll pick this up again tomorrow where I will finish the paper. I'll do part two. So what I will do is I will come off my shared screen if I can. Oh, where are we going on? Uh, StreamYard. Right, and then go back. To do that, I've just cut that off. Let's go for that one. I like it. Hey guys, right, I'm gonna, I've been going long enough today already. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pick this up again tomorrow um, and I'll finish off the paper. At, and so, I'll label this as part one. Guys, I hope your holiday's going okay. I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye. You know, you can't do it.